starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, um, I'm Dr. Matt Pred hyatt from the Great Plains Laboratory, and today I'm going to be talking about how environmental toxins can affect mental health. The reason why this is very important is that every year more and more toxins are being released into our environment. And back into when we started using synthetic chemistry back in the 1940s up until today, chemicals released in the environment really are increasing geometrically. So just like in one year, like 1.2 billion pounds of toxic chemicals are released into the water and air in the United States alone. And then there's 80,000 different types of chemicals that are being released. And of those 80,000, only about 10% of those have had safety evaluations. And these safety evaluations are mostly done on healthy, young, white males. So that means that we're excluding older individuals, um, children, and um, people of different ethnicities and women. So really, the, in a lot of these different um, categories have different ways that they detoxify chemicals. So it's really important to like understand how these chemicals affect them as well. These chemicals enter our body in multiple different ways, either like the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, the food that we eat, the ground that we walk on, or the products that we use every day, or even other people use around us every day. And these types of products are like insecticides, weed killers, solvents, cleaning agents, soaps, plastics, the carpets that we walk on, drapes, uh, packaging material, the drugs that we put in our body, the plants that we are either eating or have in our homes or in our backyards or in the parks, the food that we're eating, water, the air that we're breathing. So a lot of these are things that we can't even control because the people around us are utilizing these chemicals and we're just being exposed to them on a daily basis. And even in our homes, there's lots of different sources of toxins that we're not even aware of, such as like plastics, uh, parabens, phthalates, uh, plastics, um, flame retardants, um, perchlorate. A lot of these different chemicals are things that we're exposed to on a daily basis. And the symptoms of toxicity are kind of like things that we see a lot uh, when we're talking to patients here at the Great Plains Laboratory, such as like loss of energy, uh, memory loss, depression, anxiety, restlessness, mental fog, um, nausea, um, sleeplessness, allergies. A lot of patients, when they get exposed to lots of chemicals, it causes them to, uh, for their immune system to become hypersensitized. So a lot of times when we look at like food sensitivities, we'll see patients that are exposed to a lot of chemicals, they get lots of, they get sensitive to lots of different foods. So today we're going to talk about like, you know, like kind of like uh, multiple different um, aspects here. We're going to talk about pesticides and herbicides, metals, phthalates, solvents, styrenes, and then we'll talk about detoxification methods. So why do you need to test? So chemicals are everywhere. We are all expressed, uh, are exposed to chemicals, so it's important to understand what our load is. And everybody's load is a little bit different. And the, what our load is in our body is determined by two different, uh, two different things. The first one is how much we're being exposed to and how well, how well do we detoxify. And those two things are different for every single person. And some people have a lower load of chemicals and they're able to deal with that. Other people have higher loads. And some people can deal with a higher load because they detoxify really well, and some people can't. So it's really important to be able to like measure these things and it helps you understand where you need to like uh, direct your attention for, for doing um, treatment. And when you're testing, you need to like measure one thing, and those are testing usually needs, should be done through LCMS, and LCMS stands for liquid chromatography mass spec. And it's much more sensitive than amino acid or ELISA. Um, it's able to give you accurate measurements, and it's very sensitive, and it's, it's, you're able to determine if the exposure is acute or chronic. 
So organophosphates, um, the organophosphates are the ester of phosphoric acid and the basis of most insecticides, herbicides, and nerve agents. So pesticides are, there's lots of different chemicals and we met in the Great Plains, we measure lots of different types of chemicals. Um, and they all like break down, many of them break down to a certain compound called DEP or diethylphosphate. And this is a normal uh, measurement of DEP here. And then there's the other metabolite that you can actually have for um, these. And this one is DMP. So where you have a lot of uh, other group of different types of organophosphates get broken down to the dimethylphosphate. And so the organophosphates for the DMP, there's 74 different organophosphates that get broken down to the DMP. And this is a short list of them here. And then you have the DEP here, which you have the other one. And all these are broken down by an enzyme called PON1. And we'll talk a little bit more about PON1 in a couple slides here. But PON1 breaks down these organophosphates into DEP. And there's 77 main different organophosphates that are sold today that get broken down to DEP. So together, um, a good um, assay will be able to combine the, DE, the DMP marker, the DEP marker, you get about 151 different chemicals that you can measure just through those two different analytes themselves. And there's lots of uh, aspects of the literature showing that organophosphate exposure can cause different diseases. Uh, this one is a paper from the Society of Toxicology showing that um, you get um, psychiatric evaluations done by patients that are exposed to organophosphates. Well, the one thing they're able to see here is that patients that are exposed to organophosphates have more diseases, and then especially with autism. And patients with autism generally don't detoxify as well as neurotypical patients. And one reason why this is, is because patients with autism generally have a lower um, active um, enzyme of PON1, which we had just mentioned before, which breaks down the organophosphates. And here we uh, have a graph here showing patients with autism here on the left and neurotypical controls on the right. And patients with autism have much lower activity of PON1 than the control samples do. Here's a paper from 2014 talking about um, PON or talking about um, genes implicated in um, associated with um, autism. And one of those was PON1. Um, and three of the five um, studies, PON1 was associated with autism. And then other ones that are associated are like glutathione transferase. Um, you have the M1 version and the P1 version. And we'll talk a little bit more about wh why glutathione, glutathione S transferase is important for detoxification. Here's another paper talking about PON1. This is how kind of like how to like uh, increase activity of PON1. This is a paper from 20, uh, 2011 talking about how if you drink uh, pomegranate juice daily, you can act, uh, further activate the PON1 enzyme. Um, how much you need to drink is um, different in some um, studies. I have usually have seen like between like 200 milliliters to like eight ounces of pomegranate juice a day can su su sufficiently increase the activity of the PON1 enzyme, allowing the body to better detoxify these organophosphates. There's other possibilities. So there's um, some different um, companies out there that sell pomegranate um, juice extract. So um, one um, soft gel provides the approximately 24 to 30 uh, pomegranates. It also supports prostate and breast tissue as well as heart, kidneys, and liver function. Uh, pomegranate juice is also a very powerful antioxidant. So the next chemical we're going to talk about is pyrethrins, and this uh, these are insecticides. So these are like things that people will like spray on their lawn to try to kill different types of in, um, pest insects, such as like cockroaches, or um, ants, or other um, mosquitoes as well. 
And pyrethrins are developed from a flower, but they've been chemically changed to make them a lot more potent, or that means like more toxic. Um, and unfortunately, they're more toxic to the insects, but they're also more toxic to the humans as well. The, these pyrethrins are one of the most commonly used pesticides in the market today. The way that you measure pyrethrins is you don't measure the, um, the parent compound, you actually measure this human metabolite called 3PBA. And that's what most laboratories do to me measure pyrethrins is look at this 3PBA metabolite. And there's a lot of papers on the literature indicate why pyre different pyrethrins are important. They've been linked to like Parkinson's disease, um, alterations to the dopamine transporter function, which is um, dopamine transporters that have been linked to autism as well, uh, pesticide toxicity and motor neuron disease. Here's a paper from 2015 looking at um, patients from eight to 15 year olds and whether or not they've been exposed to pyrethrins. And children with the urinary 3PBA, so the ones that have been exposed to uh, the most pyrethrins, were twice as likely to develop ADHD compared to those below the limit of detection. So the LOD means the limit of detection. Um, and the hyperactive impulses symptoms, not only that, were you more likely to have ADHD, but the symptoms got worse depending on how much exposure that you had. So every tenfold increase of exposure increased your symptoms by about 50%. Uh, other um, herbicide that we that is normally measured is called 2,4-D. Uh, this was a common um, a, uh, agent used in the Vietnam War because it's a component of the um, the plant killer agent orange. And so 2,4-D was a mixture called agent orange used by the U.S. during the Vietnam War to increase the visibility of by, for war planes by destroying plant undergrowth and crops. Herbicides are chemical agents intend to kill unwanted herb vege vegetation, such as broadleaf weeds and woody plants. People can be exposed to herbicides by breathing them in, by con contact from their residential use, by living near application sites. And I'll tell you, uh, so one thing that we do see in our testing is that uh, patients do increase in the 2,4-D exposure in the spring. And that's the one reason why this is that a lot of people use uh, um, a weed killer called uh, weed and feed or a, a fertilizer called weed and feed. And they put this on their lawn and the weed and feed has um, a large amount of 2,4-D in it. It's one of the main ingredients in weed and feed. So... Um, people will be able to, they'll put this on the lawn and then the children will walk uh, through the lawn afterwards and they'll absorb a lot of this particular herbicide. In here is the, what the, one of the boxes or packaging looks like, the turf builder. Um, and this turf builder isn't approved through a, from a lot of different countries, but it, you will find it um, all over the place in almost every hardware store at, um, in the United States. Um, but it's not approved in like Denmark, Norway, Kuwait, um, many Canadian provinces, and um, Australia as well. Men who work with 2,4-D are at risk for abnormally shaped sperm and impaired fertility, um, increases your risk of ALS, it um, interferes with the myelination in the brain, it also can cause weakness, nausea, abdominal pain, headaches, dizziness, um, neuropathy, stupor, seizures. So here's a, um, a case study that we've had from a three-year-old child with autism. And this patient was exposed to a large amount of 2,4-D. Um, what you see here is three, uh, a bar graph with three different points here. You'll see the LOQ, which is the lower limit of quantification. So that's how low our instruments are able to measure. We're able to measure up to our anything above 0.2 micrograms per gram of creatinine. The 75th percentile means that if you are at this marker, that means that you have a higher 
valued in about 75 out of 100 people. So that means that you only 25 people out of 100 have a higher value than you would. The 95th percentile is similar to that, where you have a value higher than 95 out of 100 people. And this particular patient was 28 times higher than our 95th percentile. And what this does is this causes a lot of mitochondrial dysfunction here, where you see like the succinic acid get elevated quite a bit, the fumaric acid also becoming quite elevated, as well as the citric acid becoming very elevated. The next compound that we're going to talk about is something you, uh, I'm sure that everybody has come across. It's um, called glyphosate, which is a kind of one of the main ingredients in the herbicide Roundup. And Roundup is plant put, put on lots of different crops, such as um, corn, soy, cotton, canola, alfalfa, wheat. What it does is it inhibits a, an enzyme which allows the plants to grow. There's even some foods that aren't genetically modified that they still use it, uh, such as like wheat, barley, rice, sweet potatoes, cotton. They, what they use this is to like kill any like remaining green parts of the plant, so it makes it easier to harvest. And the amount of Roundup that's being used in the United States is greatly increasing here. So here, what you see is a usage in 1994. And this is what the usage looked like in 2012. So you see a much greater increase of usage um, in the from the in the these like 16 or 18 years here. So you go from 1994 to 2012. And glyphosate inhibits plants and some bacteria's um, enzyme here. And what this really does here is that it actually like kills a lot of the beneficial bacteria in your gut. So when you um, absorb glyphosate in your body, it will attack the beneficial bacteria, but the pathogenic bacteria in your gut actually um, absorbs the um, amino acids from your own body. So it's not actually making its own. So the pathogenic bacteria overgrows and the beneficial bacteria dies off, and so it causes an overgrowth. Other things that you see for glyphosate is it inhibits the cytochrome P450s, and the cytochrome P450s are really important in the body because that's really what does a lot of the detoxification in the body, um, especially for um, small molecules. So here's a paper from 2018, and they're looking at um, neurotoxicity in rats. And what they saw here is that brain regions were susceptible to changes in the CNS. Uh, glyphosate reduced um, the 5-HDA um, norepinephrine levels in brain regions as a dose-related manner. And nowadays, they're actually you know, trying to find, put uh, into new products here. So this is a new product uh, coming out called Endless Duo, which is a combination of glyphosate and the other molecule that we had talked about earlier, the 2,4-D. So now you're putting this on, on crops. That, so now you're getting 2,4-D and glyphosate both put on the same crops together. So protecting against glyphosate exposure, what can people do? Well, obviously the, the top thing to do is to choose organic and non-GMO certified foods, um, increase sulfur rich foods consumption, such as eggs, cheese, garlic, onions, and use organic or grass fed bones for broth. So uh, you want to avoid non-organic collagen products as well. So the next topic we're gonna to talk about is heavy metals. So the main metals that we are very worried about causing um, health risk are like mercury, lead, cadmium, arsenic, copper, um, aluminum. So the first one that we'd like to mention here is lead. So um, tetraethyl lead was found as a gasoline additive. Um, soil near major highways were contaminated. Um, Paint was another common contaminant until 1982, and still a lot of older homes still contain um, lead paint. I know here in the Kansas City, I know that a lot of older homes still have lead paint in them, and it's something that um, 
some people are still worried about in this area. Um, like lead contamination testing of paint is readily available, however, so it is a thing that you can do to test the paint in your home, if you, especially if you have an, an older home. And right now there has no amount of lead is considered to be non-harmful. All levels of lead exposure are harmful. Uh, here's a paper from 1996, and what they are looking at here is hair levels related to attention deficit disorder. So they looked at um, 277 first grade students, and they are looking at how much lead was in all of these students looking at hair specimens. What they found here was a relationship that existed between the patients that had the most ADHD, ADHD, and how much lead they had in the lead they had in their body. Like I said before, there is no apparent safe threshold for lead. So here is a graph here looking at um, patients with autism or um, neurotypical. So the autism group is in the blue and neurotypical is in the purple. So um, uranium, you really don't see a lot of uranium in either group. However, in mercury and lead, you see um, a lot, much larger amounts. I mean, you see almost uh, tenfold uh, more uh, mercury in the autistic group, and you see almost uh, um, almost a doubling of lead in the autistic group here. In this paper here, we're looking at uh, mercury in um, hair. And so we have uh, male controls and female controls over here on the left. And then you have the autistic groups here over on the right. And as you can see here, the autistic groups have much more mercury in their system in the, than the control neurotypical groups do. Next group we're gonna talk about is phthalates. So obviously we all are exposed to lots of different plastics um, every day. And so either from like drinking bottles or from the food uh, that uh, that are the pa food packaging, um, the clothes that we wear sometimes have plastic in them for like um, different like jackets and stuff. So all these like different things that contain phthalates in them. And phthalates don't just come from plastics; they also come from a lot of different like um, ha hair care and other like personal care products that we have or cleaning solutions. Um, Aspirin also has phthalates in it. Um, nail polish has lots of phthalates in it, as, as well as acrylamide. Um, shampoo has phthalates, cosmetics, insecticides, cleaning products, uh, food, microwaved and plastics releases a lot of phthalates. Um, printing inks, um, people I like, talk about um, getting receipts quite often and how like lots of different receipts from like stores contain phthalates in them. Um, pharmaceuticals have phthalates, um, adhesives have phthalates, um, perfumes have lots of phthalates in them. And phthalates get broken down um, to a compound called MEP, and that's what most laboratories utilize for measuring phthalates here. And phthalates can, one of the major things that has been shown to be um, occurring here is how um, testosterone levels in men have been decreasing over the last 50 years. So in this one study published in 2007, they were looking at 1,500 men in the greater Boston area. And what they did is they took like um, testosterone levels at different like time points here um, for, the, for men in this area here. And they showed here is that the average total testosterone levels of men aged 65 to 69 fell from 503 nanograms per deciliter in 1998 to only 423 nanograms per deciliter in 2003. Um, so we're seeing a lot of decrease of, um, of testosterone in men. And there's other things. Um, the Center for Disease Control found that breakdown chemicals from two of the most common cosmetic phthalates in almost every member of the group. They looked at um, almost 2,800 people and they found phthalates in almost all of them. A study in, from the EHP in 2005 showed that men who used the most personal hair care products, such as aftershave and cologne, 
at the highest urinary levels of the DEP. And then here's another like more recent study here looking at sperm counts. If, uh, this is a study from 2017. In the last four decades, male sperm count has decreased by half. So looking at uh, men from the age from like 20 to 30, um, and four decades ago, they had twice as much um, active sperm than men do today. So this is definitely affecting um, fertility in men. And I'm sure it has other like um, productive and health um, aspects to it as well. So the next grouping that we're going to talk about here is solvents. And solvents are in a lot of different products. Um, they are in gasoline and oil tobacco smoke, um, car exhaust, industrial emissions, glues, paints, furniture polishes, detergents, um, polystyrene production, um, lubricants. And there's like two main forms of solvents that we are really like looking for here. And the first one is xylenes. Uh, these are also called um, diethyl, dimethyl benzenes. And they're found in like paints, pesticides, cleaning fluids. Um, cigarette smoke and perfume. And xylene gets broken down through a different pathway. Called, so it goes from xylene to toluene to um, into the liver and then it gets formed into this compound called methylhypuric acid. And methylhypuric acid is usually what most labs utilize to measure. The other compound that you are looking at here is like benzene and benzene can either um, be singular or it can form like bimethyl benzene and it gets broken down um, into this uh, compound down here in the bottom called N-acetylphenylcysteine. That's what a lot of labs measure here. So it's a glutathione adduct here and we'll talk a little bit more about glutathione and how it's important for detoxification in just a little bit. Benzene toxicity, so it's looking at like drowsiness and fatigue, dizziness, rapid heart rate, headaches, tumors, confusion, unconsciousness, um, irritation to the stomach, um, sleepiness. So the next compound we're going to talk about are styrenes. And styrene is a key component in a lot of different things. Um, it's in like green technology, so it's computers, uh, it's in carpeting, it's in insulation, it's in car parts, it's in um, tires, it's in food packaging, it's in toys. And one thing that we've seen um, through our testing is that patients that are people in our own company that have purchased new cars, and we offer free testing for our employees, and we see that their styrene levels increase after they purchase a new car. So we know that like, I mean, that new car smell that you are exp experiencing, a lot of that new car smell is pretty much the styrenes. So one thing that we've also th seen is that some um, free styrenes is in all styrofoam containers and it's dissolved by heat. So one experiment that you can easily do is that you can like weigh a uh, styrofoam cup and then you can like pour like a hot liquid into it. And then you let sit there for about 10 minutes, pour out the hot liquid and then measure it again. And a lot of times what you'll see here is that the cup actually weighs less than it did initially because the styrenes and a lot of other like chemicals have been absorbed into the liquid, which you would drink. And then it um, causes the, you to um, absorb a lot of these chemicals. Styrenes is all metabolized down to a compound called um, PGA. And styrene toxicity involves like nausea, headache, fatigue, CNS depression, um, irritation of the upper airways. Um, it's very carcinogenic. The next thing we're going to talk about here is fuel additives. And the two most common one is MTBE and ETBE. So in some um, states, actually MTBE has been outlawed. But unfortunately, a lot of times what the, has occurred is they've just switched over to the ETBE. Or there's actually even the other chemical, even besides the ETBE, that some other um, 
companies have started been using as well. So that's one of the problems that you have here is that we'll find a chemical that is shown to be toxic. And what the um, industry does is they'll just like add like a methyl group to it. Well, it's a completely do new um, compound. The properties really haven't changed that much of it. It's still very toxic. But at least they're like, I mean, at least for them, they're allowed to use it. Unfortunately for us, we're still becoming toxified with these new um, molecules. The problem for like using these as fuel additives is that in a lot of like gas stations, you will have these like le leaking, leaky storage tanks, which is causing um, ETBE and MTB to like, um, contaminating the either like the water supply in the area or the ground in the area as well. And uh, ET, these two compounds are measured by a compound called 2-HIB, which is right here. One of the one of the biggest um, contaminations of MTV was um, was shown back in um, Santa Monica back in 1996, where 85 percent of the municipal water supply was contaminated with MTBE. Uh, the city did not provide or did not provide water from its own wells until 2010, after suing the three major oil companies in the area. So if you have really high amounts of MTBE and ETBE, this can cause some um, types of symptoms. It can cause mitochondrial stress, can cause nausea, drowsiness, vomiting, uh, mild symptoms such as the nervous system um, toxicity, such as like tremors. One way that we can measure mitochondrial stress is through succinic acid, which is a component of the organic acid test. And succinic acid uh, builds up when the enzyme that converts succinic acid to fumaric acid gets inhibited. And this is usually inhibited and inhibition occurs when you have toxicity in the body. This is what we see here frequently on the organic acid test is the patients with high exposure have high succinic acid here. Where you see here, this patient here has very high succinic acid. The other thing that we see is fumaric acid can also become elevated, as well as the citric acid sometimes can become elevated as well. And here is a graph here showing what people are being. So here's our healthy controls here. We're looking at succinic acid values here. And you'll see like patients with vinyl chloride, xylene, heavy metals. Um, 2,4-D, DEP, patients with these type of exposures here have much higher amounts of succinic acid. Like anything above 10 is really considered elevated. And so the vinyl chloride and the xylene, so these solvents really cause a lot of mitochondrial stress, as well as the heavy metals that we had talked about earlier, especially like the mercury and the lead. Exposure to those can cause lots of mitochondrial stress. So how do you detoxify? So you can air out your clothes from the dry clear before use and don't live in areas where toxic chemicals are used or downwind from such facilities. You can eat organic foods if you can afford it or you can grow your own garden. Don't use pesticides or herbicides in your garden and open windows and doors of new cars for days to detoxify them. So how do we um, get um, detoxified if we are exposed? So through um, our testing here, we've worked with multiple different practitioners to find ways to detoxify patients. And we've done time course of measuring after they start doing these type of protocols. And what we have seen here is one of the best ways is to induce sweating. And many chemicals are released in the sweat. You want to use towels to remove the sweat fre frequently so that they don't get reabsorbed back into the body. Um, and one of the best ways is to, to do this is to use sauna. And a lot of people ask us, well, should we use conventional sauna or um, infrared sauna, and we have found that both of these work um, 
um, equivalently good. Um, one benefit of infrared sauna is that you uh, start sweating at a lower temperature. So especially for like children or patients that are like heat sensitive, it might be better to use the infrared um, than the conventional because of their heat sensitivity. Other things that are shown to be good are like folate, B6, B12, TNG, which help um, eliminate homocysteine that decreases the ability to detoxify pesticides. Um, you can use oral or intravenous glutathione to remove many um, toxic chemicals. Use, one thing that we usually recommend is doing like 500 milligrams per day. Um, other thing that you could also do is you could do like a precursor for glutathione, which is like N-acetylcysteine. Uh, for that, you usually want to recommend about 1,000 milligrams per day. One thing that I have seen through uh, my studies is that some patients don't convert NAC to glutathione very well. So it's something, one thing that you can kind of like um, learn through the OAT of whether or not somebody is doing that conversion adequately of um, converting NAC to glutathione at an accurate rate. Um, one other thing that we usually recommend is drinking lots of water because you want to encourage sweating. And if you don't drink enough water, you won't sweat very well, but you want to drink distilled water that is done through reverse osmosis. A lot of things I also recommend is doing a carbon filtration. There's a lot of compounds that we measure on the organic or on the GPL tox that are only um, pulled out through carbon filtration, but they will pass through um, reverse osmosis, such as perchlorate. Reverse osmosis does not bind to perchlorate, so you want to make sure you're doing like a carbon filtration for that. So here's a case study here. So here's a patient that we looked at, and this patient had very high amounts of vinyl chloride and benzene. Their vinyl chloride was almost to the 95th percentile, and their um, benzene levels were past that 95th percentile. And with the, we did six months of sauna therapy for this patient. And usually for sauna therapy, we usually recommend doing it about two to three times a week for at least 30 minutes. Um, up to an hour would be better by our stand for, for time limitations. And for um, sensitivity, some people can't make it for an hour but I'd recommend at least two to three times a week for 30 minutes at, at a minimum. So I really uh, appreciate all of you listening to my talk and I very much thank you. And this, again, this is Dr. Matt Pratt-Height from the Great Plains Laboratory. And I hope to talk to all of you soon.